Welcome back to another episode in the Beyond Addiction series. My name is Adrian Webster. And in this particular episode, I really want to share with you something that's going to challenge your thinking a little bit. We're going into a subsection right now of the Beyond Addiction series, a three-part subsection, three-part mini-series, if you like, dealing with the socially acceptable drugs. I've entitled this first part, Under the Radar, Socially Acceptable Drugs, Part 1, Dealing with the Drug of Caffeine. Now, there's something you haven't heard a lot spoken of about lately, right? Caffeine as a drug, is it really that much to be worried about? I mean, it's, it's, it's all over the place. We drink it, we eat it, we, it's in our foods, it's in our medicines. Can it really be that bad? How can you even call caffeine a drug? So many people don't even think of caffeine as a drug. Yet, very astutely, uh, we know that it is one of those drugs which are flown in under the radar. Have you ever heard that expression, uh, something that comes in under the radar, meaning something that we, we, we don't, uh, we don't uh, always pick up as dangerous, that it's a threat, and, and we let it into our homes and into our societies? We get that metaphor from the military world, where despite radar technology, which is used to pick up incoming, potentially enemy aircrafts, when a fighter pilot flies at a certain altitude, we, they can fly, as it were, below the radar, be, be below the ability of the radar to pick them up on the screen. And they hope that by this method, they will be able to infiltrate, infiltrate deep into enemy territory undetected. Is it possible that in our lives, in our homes, in our societies, and even in our churches, that there is a drug that has flown in under the radar? It has crept in unnoticed, unannounced. No one talks about it because we don't even see it as a drug. I believe that it is, and that is the drug called caffeine. One author has referred to this drug, to this caffeine drug, which is known as trimethylxanthine. Uh, that's the fancy name for caffeine. They refer to this drug as the most popular drug in the world. Why? Because so many people use it. The very people that will be opposed to illegal drugs, the very people that will be opposed even to alcohol or maybe even tobacco, will be drinking their coffee and taking their caffeine. Indeed, it is the most popular drug in the world, the most widespread, the most commonly used, and the most positive, shall we say, reinforcement messages that come through this. It's advertised, it's promoted, it is uh, socially acceptable and socially promoted even amongst our young people, amongst our population. Where do we find caffeine? It's found all over the place. It's found in coffee. You know coffee well, right? Coffee is what everybody drinks. You come around to my house, I offer you coffee. You come around to my office, I offer you coffee. We go to uh, coffee shops, entire shops dedicated to the coffee industry. It's found in coffee, it's found in tea, and when we're talking about tea, we are not talking about rooibos tea or red bush tea as it's known in some parts of the world. That's great stuff, very high in antioxidants, no caffeine content, wonderful, wonderful beverage. However, we're talking about that thing which is known as black tea or English tea or salon tea, whatever you want to call it, and it is, has a fairly high concentration of caffeine. We also find caffeine in our soft drinks, in our uh, cola drinks, in our uh, Mountain Dews or whatever the, the drink is, energy drinks such as Red Bull and others. We find it in chocolate and we find it in a variety of different types of medications. What is the active dosage that's required for the first effects to be felt in a human being? About 2.5 milligrams, which is a very small amount actually. Store that in the back of your mind because when we look at the listing of caffeine content in various beverages, you're going to see it's way above 2.5 milligrams. So 2.5 milligrams hits the system, we can begin to feel it already. You'll notice that in tea, green tea in particular, 237 milliliters of the substance, we have between 30 and 50 milligrams of caffeine. A lot of people I speak to are surprised that green tea, which is promoted as a health beverage, contains caffeine. But green tea is nothing other than black tea, which is picked early. It's green tea in that it comes comes from the same tea bush, from the same tea tree, are you with me? But it is picked earlier on in the life cycle. So it's just like you get a green banana and you get a green mango, green indicating unripeness prior to maturity. That's all that green tea is. When it's picked earlier, it has a whole different family of positive 
plant chemicals, phytochemicals in the makeup of the tea, and it's those antioxidant benefits that is promoted from the health perspective. But the common denominator in both green tea and black tea, or the mature tea if you like, is the caffeine content. So really, if it doesn't say decaffeinated, you know that your green tea is containing caffeine. And even if it does say decaffeinated, really, you'll notice as we go through the list here that decaffeinated really means low caffeine. It doesn't mean no caffeine. So green tea, 30 to 50 milligrams. Black tea contains 47 milligrams. Black tea decaffeinated contains 2 milligrams. You see what we're talking about there. And then the Lipton lemon iced tea, 355 milliliters, which is basically a can of Lipton iced tea, contains 10 milligrams of, uh, of caffeine. Going on from there to the coffee, Espresso, now espresso is a very strong brew, and so we're talking about 30 milliliters, which is a very small cup of espresso. 30, millimeter, 30 milliliters of espresso contains 64 milligrams of caffeine. You can see for the, for the volume of espresso, that's an extremely high level of caffeine. The instant coffee, the stuff you make in your kitchen, you know, you take it out with a little teaspoon out of a big can and you put it in a coffee cup and you pour hot water on it, that stuff, 62 milligrams of caffeine on average. Instant decaffeinated coffee, uh, 2 milligrams. Again, it's not no caffeine, it's simply low caffeine. A cafe latte, which is a rather large drink, 474 milliliters, contains 150 milligrams of caffeine. And then the caribou cappuccino, uh, 160 to 200 milligrams of caffeine. So you can see that we're actually going very high in terms of caffeine doses in some of these substances that we take in on a daily basis. When you go and you look at the stuff on your, your store's uh, shelves over there, the soft drinks that we buy for our children and so on, You'll find that Coca-Cola varies a little bit, but on average, 35 milligrams, milligrams of caffeine in a can of Coca-Cola. Diet Coke contains an even higher dosage of 47 milligrams. Pepsi-Cola contains about 38 milligrams. Mountain Dew, about 54 milligrams. And Mellow Yellow, 53 milligrams. So you can see we're getting more or less the same as a cup of coffee or a cup of tea when we're drinking these uh, soda beverages off the shelf. Not to mention the sugar content and what that does to your immune system. That would be a subject for another time. Then our energy drinks. There was once an energy drink which was called cocaine. But of course, anti-lobbying, anti-drug groups uh, got together and uh, um, protested against this name, thinking it would encourage illicit drug use. So they took it off the market and they renamed it. And with sort of tongue in cheek, they brought it back onto the market and they called it No Name. It's called No Name. So the No Name drink there is 240 milliliters of this stuff contains 280 milligrams of caffeine. Now, when you consider milliliter for milliliter, you'll find that the closest competitor is Red Bull. You see also there 245 milliliters, and that's at 76 milligrams of caffeine. In other words, No Name is almost three times the dose of caffeine as Red Bull, and then your Rockstar and your Sobe Adrenaline Rush, those are much larger drinks at 474 milliliters, and they're containing 160 and 152 milligrams, respectively. So these energy drinks are nothing other than a strong dose of caffeine, to put it bluntly. It's really just like taking some sort of amphetamine or some sort of methamphetamine to, to give you energy. It's the same basic principle. It's the same philosophy of using a substance to artificially stimulate energy release. And we're going to understand how it works neurobiologically in just a little while. When we go over to medicines, we'll notice that caffeine is in a large variety of medicines because drugs are medications and medications are drugs. So what we know here is that if you look at the Benelin Cold and Flu Max, 25 milligrams, Anodin Extra Soluble Tablets, 45 milligrams, Panadol Extra Soluble Tablets, 65 milligrams, Excedrin Extra Strength, 65 milligrams, and then No Dose, Maximum Strength, No Dose is of course a, a stay awake type pill, at 200 milligrams of caffeine. I mean, that is a phenomenal dosage, friends. That will really wire you awake, so to speak. Won't be able to sleep. But what is it doing to the brain? What is it doing to the body? It is not your friend. It is not helping you. It is, in fact, harming you. So let's have a look at the caffeine basics. And I just love this statement of somebody who's actually synthesized the bottom line about how caffeine works. They write the following. When caffeine produces positive changes in subjective effects, the profile of these changes is remarkably similar to that produced by deamphetamine and cocaine. 
Let me translate that into English. What they're saying is when you use caffeine or caffeinated beverages and you look at the characteristics, the effects that the caffeine has on the body, they are seeing a similarity between the profile, the characteristics of the effects of caffeine and the effects and the profile of that which is given to you through amphetamine or through cocaine. They're saying that these two have a similar physiological response in terms of the subjective experience. When you drink your caffeine and you feel those, ah, I'm starting to feel good now, I'm starting to feel energetic. Those are the same basic characteristics as what the amphetamine or the cocaine substances will do to the body. Are you seeing a similarity here? If throughout this series, we'll constantly remind you that drugs are medications and medications are drugs, and beyond that statement, that the socially acceptable and the illegal drugs work on the same basic principle. You'll notice the neurobiology of caffeine is very similar to that of tobacco, alcohol, uh, as they say there, amphetamine, cocaine, the illegal, illegal, it doesn't matter. They work in the same way inside of the brain. So how could we be against one group and not against them all. How is it that we find the one is welcome in our homes and the other one is not? It's damaging the brain in a similar way. Yes, we're not saying that caf caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, the socially acceptable ones are just as dangerous or on a par in terms of physical harm, but when it comes to addiction and when it comes to the way they use and abuse the reward pathway of the brain, they are very similar in nature. You'll remember from our previous uh, uh, episodes uh, how we described the process of addiction inside the brain. And yet we're saying that just like with cocaine and amphetamine, caffeine works in a similar way, creating a very similar profile of effects inside of the body. So therefore, the effects from a physiological perspective is euphoria, that is, well-being. That's why we take all the different types of drugs, because we perceive them to be giving us a sense of reward, euphoria. It increases our perception of our energy levels. We'll understand why in a little while when we look at how it works inside the brain and the body. It increases our sense of alertness. That's why we like to use it as business people or, or, or as students doing work because it makes us feel like we're concentrating more, more appropriately. It improves self-confidence and sociability. You kind of come out of your little shell. You want to talk with people, spend time with them. It increases, of course, your gastric acid levels. So if you already have a problem with heartburn and so on, this is a drug you want to stay away from. And it increases anxiety or dysphoria. Dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria. It creates, when you're especially coming off of the substance, a state where you don't feel so great and it increases the sense of uh, anxiety. Furthermore, it causes cerebral vasoconstriction, which is the fancy way of saying it restricts blood flow to the brain. And look at the amount. It restricts blood flow to the brain between 18 and 30%. Now, I don't know if you want to get more out of your brain or not, but if you do, this is not the drug that you want to be taking. It increases your risk of seizures. It increases your blood pressure because it's a vasoconstrictor. So you have the same volume of blood, but now the substance is causing the art arteries and the arterioles to constrict in size, which means it's trying to compress the same amount of liquid into less space, which pushes up blood pressure. It's going to increase your desire to urinate through diuresis. It increases the metabolic rate, and it decreases reaction time. Isn't that interesting? While it's supposed to create the sense of greater alertness, it actually decreases reaction time. Huh. Interesting uh, uh, conflict there. It also causes withdrawal symptoms, and you will know this well if you've been playing with uh, this drug. Uh, things like tremors, you get the shakes. It causes headaches and irritability, nausea, blurred vision, fatigue, drowsiness, and apathy. You can't get going unless you have the substance, and so we keep taking the drug. In fact, the author that we quoted just now goes on to say that caffeine is more likely to produce dysphoria or anxiety with increases in dose than, than the way amphetamine or cocaine does. So in other words, if you increase the dose of amphetamine that a person's taking or you increase the dose of cocaine that they're taking, they have less chance of, of, of increasing their sense of anxiety and dysphoria as the person who's increasing their dosage of caffeine. So while you increase your caffeine dosage, you get this disproportionate increase in dysphoria even more so than the illegal drugs. Are you starting to get where I'm going with this? While it's socially acceptable and nobody even talks about the negative effects of caffeine, when you start to do a little bit of medical research, you will discover it is bad for your brain. It is bad for your body. You don't want this to be a part of your lifestyle. So let's have a look here at the neurobiology, how this problem of caffeine addiction works inside of the brain. Well, 
Adenosine is a neuromodulator in the brain which reduces excitability and causes vasodilation. So this adenosine molecule binds to its little receptors inside of the brain and it slows you down. You may experience this as fatigue or as tiredness. In addition to which, it causes vasodilation which allows more blood flow into the brain. Okay, And it has different types of receptors and it depends on where it connects as to which of these various effects that it plays inside the brain, which of those effects takes, uh, takes place. Caffeine, when you drink your caffeine or you take it into the body, it blocks the functioning of adenosine A1 and A2, uh, A2A, which is the two, two of the different types of adenosine subreceptors, and it blocks their functioning, so it increases excitability in the brain. Because if adenosine is the brakes and you take the brakes off, then what happens? You get the message to stimulate, to work faster, to work uh, at greater levels of excitability. So when it blocks adenosine, the brain perceives itself to be excited, and it also increases the general central nervous system activity. It increases the firing of the neurons that result in the pituitary gland secreting hormones that stimulate the release of adrenaline. So here's what happens. You have the pituitary gland inside of your brain. It sees all this excitability happening around it, all these neurons firing at greater than normal uh, uh, speeds and frequencies, and it says, wait a second, something's happening here. The brain is getting overexcited. I need to get the body ready for commensurate action. So the pituitary gland secretes a, a hormone which reacts with the adrenaline glands to empty the adrenal glands of their adrenaline into the bloodstream. And what does adrenaline do? It gives you a sense of energy. It gives you a sense of alertness. It creates the fight or flight response. So when you're being chased by a big dog, adrenaline is great. But when you're not being chased like by a big dog, you don't want a whole lot of adrenaline in the system. But the pituitary gland is tricked into thinking there's some sort of situation that the body's going to be called upon to have to meet because the rest of the brain is firing like mad. It's overstimulated. And so you get this adrenaline being released into the system as well. But by blocking the adenosine A2A uh, vasodilator receptors, caffeine causes cerebral vasoconstriction. So the, so the, the, the adenosine should allow blood to flow to the brain freely. It's blocking that, and so there's vasoconstriction. By the way, what gives you the headache when you are withdrawing from your caffeine is that this effect of blocking these, the adenosine A2A sub-receptor type is removed. So while it was restricting blood flow, all of a sudden those veins and those arteries begin to dilate and this loss of blood pressure in the brain is what gives you the feeling of the headache. So you go and drink more caffeine, it causes vasoconstriction and thus the headache goes away. Does that make sense to you? That's the physiology between how that works, how that happens inside of the brain. So we block blood flow to the brain, we release adrenaline into the system, we overexcite the neurons that are firing around the pituitary gland, we think we're wide awake, we think we're energetic, but the reality is that by blocking the adenosine A1 receptors, we stimulate the dopamine release. So now we start to feel good as well. So we've got less blood flowing to the brain, we have adrenaline in the system, we have overexcitability of the neurons, and we have more dopamine than normal being released. And so we feel good, we feel energetic, but the reality is it's a state of self-deception. So caffeine also inhibits dopamine reuptake. Do you remember in our previous episodes how we described the process of recycling? Caffeine blocks that. So it overstimulates the release of dopamine and then it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. Are you seeing a similarity here? Remember those illegal drugs that we used as illustrations in previous lectures and which we will unpack in even more detail in coming lectures? How those illegal drugs did a similar thing? They either blocked the reuptake or they overstimulated the release or they mimicked dopamine? Well, guess what? Yeah, caffeine's doing the same thing. It's socially acceptable, it's legal, but it acts on the same principle, on the same reward pathway to overstimulate and to block the reuptake of dopamine, giving you a sense of euphoria, sense of overstimulation and of energy. But it's a state, like any other drug, of self-deception. So, let me make a real plain, real strong statement here about my feelings of caffeine. Caffeine should have no part whatsoever in a Christian's diet and lifestyle. Now, if you happen to perhaps not be a Christian, it should have no part in any human lifestyle or diet because guess what? It works on the same principles as all our illegal drugs. We're just doing the same thing on a lesser level. 
So if we're against the one, why would, be, we, why would we be in favor of the other? But especially if you are a Christian, if you come from a Christian background, let me speak to you very specifically about this. This should have no part in a Christian diet and lifestyle. You're sitting there thinking, well, Adrian, you know, there's no Bible verse that says, thou shalt not caffeinate thyself. Yeah, well, there's no Bible verse either that says, thou shalt not get high on cocaine, or thou shalt not get high on heroin, or thou shalt not get high on, 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 on tobacco or nicotine or anything else. Those verses do not spell that out, but when you understand the principles of the Bible's teachings, you will be able to reason from cause to effect and realize it shouldn't be part of my lifestyle. So what I would like to do in the last few moments is actually take you through some of the biblical principles. While you won't find a Bible verse by itself which says, Thou shalt not caffeinate thyself, you will find the principles in Scripture that would be against all forms of addiction, all substance abuse, including that of caffeinating yourself. The first principle is found in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20, where it says, the, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body was given to you as a gift. It was not given to you so that you could destroy it, break it down, get rid of it, cast it away so that you can have a new one later on. You have been given a body temple. How should you treat the body temple? How should you treat this gift that God has been given to you? If you showed up at church one day and you walked into the sanctuary area of the church and there was graffiti on the walls and there were posters all over the walls, would you say to yourself, oh wow, look, this is great. This is appropriate for a place which is the sanctuary or the temple of God. Surely you wouldn't. So why do we treat our bodies, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, why do we treat our bodies with such contempt? On the basis of the body temple alone, you would know that when you understand the physiology and the neurobiology, as we've outlined it very briefly in this section, in this summary of the, the problem of, of caffeine, then you will know that if that is the physiology and the neurobiology, it can't be a part of my experience uh, because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I need to treat it with dignity and respect. Second principle is found in the Gospel of John 8 verse 36. Where Jesus says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is the principle of freedom. That Jesus writes and he says, I came to set the captives free. He, he, his, his mission down here was to liberate us from the hand of slavery. Liberate us from this giant tyrant called addiction. This giant tyrant called sin and its consequences. Now question for you. If you are controlled by a substance, and let's forget about where on the scale of physical harm it, it, it is located, like caffeine and alcohol and tobacco, socially acceptable, kill you really slowly and painfully, or whether it is the hardcore drugs, you know, the cocaine and the heroin, which will addict you real quickly, real hard, and will kill you quickly as well, high risk of overdose and all that. Forget about that scale of how fast it will kill you, and just think about the concept of addiction. And here's the question. If you are controlled by a substance, regardless of socially acceptable or not, regardless of physical harm and the scale where, where it falls on that scale, if you are controlled by any substance, are you free? Can you say you've experienced the freedom that God came to bring when you are controlled by a substance? When you don't get that substance, you start going through withdrawal and you're experiencing dysphoria and all the rest of it. Have you found freedom? Is it possible that we are denying God of the joy that He experiences when He liberates people from the problem of sin and the problem of addiction by choosing to willfully, as Christians, retain this lifestyle habit in our diet and in our lifestyle? I mean, surely, friends, you can realize that if the gospel of Jesus Christ is about freedom, then anything that we choose to maintain in our lifestyle that entraps us and holds us there has got to go. The gospel of freedom militates against the idea of caffeine or any other addiction in our lives. Another principle that you will find in Scripture is that we are to become like Christ, right? The goal of the plan of salvation is not only your forgiveness. The goal of the plan of salvation is to change you and to transform you and to recreate you in the beauty of the character of God Himself. He wants to share His characteristics with you. He does this through the Holy Spirit. So every morning you as a Christian, you get down on your knees, you say, Lord, help me to be like my Master Jesus Christ. You say, give me the Holy Spirit that I might be, might be like my Master Jesus Christ. I can't do it in myself. I want you to help me. I need you to help me. He 
gives us the Holy Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you should bear the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Let's have a look here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now let's go through that a little more slowly. And let's compare this to the experience of addiction. Let's compare this to caffeine. Let's ask you to compare the fruits of the Spirit with the symptoms of caffeine withdrawal. When you are withdrawing from caffeine, do you feel greater love for people who are irritating you? Do you feel more joy in your heart when you're withdrawing from caffeine? Do you find yourself more at peace with the world around you when you're going through withdrawal? Do you find yourself more long-suffering or more patient when you're going through caffeine withdrawal? Do you find yourself uh, uh, being willing to be more kind and, and all the rest of it, and more gentle with others when you're going through caffeine withdrawal, yes or no? If you're being honest, you'll know that the answer to that question is a very big no. Are you, when you are addicted to a substance, self-controlled, one of the fruits of the Spirit, or are you controlled by another? Can you see how addiction is out of harmony with scriptural principle, including the so-called socially acceptable lesser addictions like caffeine? Yes, friends, we cannot get down on our knees, pray every morning saying, Lord, liberate me, make me like Christ, give me the fruits of the Spirit, and then willfully with retain in our lifestyle something which when I don't get it on time makes me the opposite of everything I'm praying for. There's another verse in the Bible that says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve Him when we mess Him around. I want this, but I'm not going to help you. I'm going to do everything in my power to retain in my lifestyle, in my diet, things which are going to make me the opposite of what I'm asking you to do in my life. What would you do if a friend came to you for help and every time you try to help them, they roadblocked you, they didn't want to listen to you? Eventually, you'd tell them to get lost. We do the same thing to God every day. We try and retain in our lives those things which are harming us, which we're asking Him to help us to overcome. Another principle is that we are not to be a stumbling stone for anybody else. Luke 17 verse 1, Jesus gives us a stern warning. He says, it's impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Yes, there are people who are going to trip other people up, but don't let that person be you. You know what? Young people are real smart, friends. They can pick up hypocrisy just like that. You're saying, you know, don't get your life tangled up with addiction. Don't let substances control your moods. You sit down with your child. They're going to high school. You have that long talk with them about premarital sex and choosing your friends and not going to parties and being wise and watching out for substances. Then after that, you get up. You're like, whew, that was so stressful. I need something to calm me down. I need something to help me. So I go for the, the, the pot of coffee. Can you see the hypocrisy? I am modeling what I'm telling my child not to do. Yes, it's a lesser substance. Yes, it's socially acceptable, but it's the same behavior. And then we wonder why our young people take it to the next level, as it were. Another principle is that we need to be consistent, friends. Drug addiction or substance abuse is substance abuse no matter what the method of administration. If I came to your house for the day and I brought with me as I came to your house a little, a little sachet bag and inside that was a needle, a syringe and a vial of liquid caffeine and every two or three hours I had to be excused from your presence to go to your bathroom to inject myself, to mainline the caffeine into my veins, what would you call me? You would call me an addict and you would say I need help. But why is it that if we all sit around the table together and we all take it orally in our cup of coffee or tea, that's not substance abuse? It's the same substance, isn't it? It's going to have the same physiological effect, isn't it? The only difference is that it's taken orally instead of injected. And guess what? All our illegal drugs, they can, they can, be, sw they can be swallowed as well. They can be digested through the stomach, absorbed through the lining of the stomach wall into the bloodstream, straight to the brain, creates a high. If the illegal drugs can be used that way, and we would still call them illegal uh, and call them drugs, then why is it that when we use the socially acceptable drugs, it would be fine to drink our coffee, but it would not be fine to mainline our caffeine? Same drug, same physiology, it's, it's the same thing. It's just a different method of administration. Can you understand what we're getting at here, friends? You see, from a biblical perspective, we want to stay away from all these substances. It doesn't matter about legal, illegal, socially acceptable, or not socially acceptable. The principles of Scripture militate against slavery, militate against the principle of addiction. We want to be sure that we live a life of freedom. The bottom line, friends, the bottom line is found in this wonderful Bible text here. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I hope and I pray that you will make your decision on this subject not based on the common practices of the world and the common practices of other Christians out there, the common practices of anybody else, what the majority is doing, but that you will be intelligent, that you will reason through this thing from cause to effect for yourself, that you will make the number one priority in your life to 
please God and to give Him the glory, whether you're eating or whether you're drinking or whatever you're doing. So may God bless you as you seek to eliminate from your lifestyle what others may see as socially acceptable, but which you know from scriptural principle, from gospel reasoning, is not acceptable with God and is out of harmony with what you're asking God to do in your life through the working of His Spirit. May God bless you. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, will you guide the viewer? Will you give them courage to take a stand on this area where so many people see nothing wrong with it? Will you help them to, to maintain the highest standards rather than just the socially acceptable standards? Will you give them joy and will you give them healing and will you give them the abundant life and the life of freedom? For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.